Good day, everybody. Um, I'm Adrian Harris. This is Psychoanalysis Today. And I have really the wonderful uh, experience and privilege of interviewing Dr. Zver Varvin, um, who is well known, I know, in our analytic community for his work on trauma and his work on refugee groups. Um, this is part of our issue on psychoanalysis and the community and the ways in which psychoanalysis enters the world. Let me just say a few things about Dr. Varvin. He is an analyst in private practice, a senior researcher at the Norwegian Center for Violence and Traumatic Stress Studies, affiliated with the University of Oslo. He's had many positions in the Norwegian Psychoanalytic Society and also the IPA. And he's presently chair of the European Psychoanalytic Association's Working Group on Trauma. I'll just mention two of his many books, uh, Flight and Exile, which is published uh, in Norwegian, and a book that he edited with Vamak Volkan, Violence or Dialogue. <clears throat> he's also doing a lot of consulting and research with uh, Vladimir Jovic in the Balkans, and it's a very active clinician, researcher, theorist um, in the whole experience that migrant persons and peoples are having. So let's begin. And um, I, I wanted, I want you just to start and um, tell us about your work um, with uh, consulting and doing work with refugee groups and refugee camps. I was particularly interested in your ideas that the trauma to which migrant persons are susceptible is very particular. It's actually somewhat different from the other more ways, PTSD, that we think of trauma. So your ideas involve a lot of experiences of the body and time. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about this. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, I think that uh, we uh, have two when uh, it concerns trauma and refugees, but I think also trauma in general, that we have to take the context much more into consideration. And there is a special context for the traumatization of those who become refugees and uh, then live in exile. Uh, and, and the context is... Um, uh, uh, First of all, that the society they come from has been, there has been war, they have, they have been exposed to quite violent actions from military forces, many have been in prison, tortured and so on. And then they, uh, when they flee, we can see now that uh, there is an increasing violence against refugees on flight and increasing possibility, increasing possibility for, uh, for severe damage and death. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, to, uh, one, one must understand this traumatization as a violation of their human dignity. Uh, that's why we call it human rights violation. And it is in a context where uh, they are uh, treated uh, as lesser human beings, what we call dehumanization. And this creates also uh, uh, a kind of uh, attack on their moral values because they experience to be treated as uh, uh, not really human beings, but they see a lot of other people who are treated in this way and die. And this causes a very complex reaction, which involves not only uh, the, the psychological system that we are prepared for when uh, meeting danger, like the fight-flight reactions, uh, and what is commonly understood as PTSD, but it's attack on moral values, and it's attack on ability for relations to others, to be safe in relations, and it uh, involves very much the body. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, the body is uh, uh, that's uh, have different uh, uh, 
courses, of course, but uh, very much because they are very isolated in their experience of being traumatized and the body takes over. Uh, and it's a rule that uh, those who are uh, being traumatized in this way, they have bodily pains of different sort for many years, in, in addition to an increased uh, bodily physical illness. So, but it's sort of dangerous to their health that that um, that the idea that this this experience would undermine ongoing health and and viability. Um, yes, yes, that, that's the, that's the danger. So, uh, and of course, it's uh, what, what is the most important in in trying to help or uh, uh, help these people is is to to try to. Uh, make conditions so that more resilient forces can be put in motion. Uh, and these are forces that uh, operate on a bodily level uh, and as well as a mental level. But it's very much dependent on a positive social context. Could, could you say a little about um, how, when you talk about building resilience, what are the kinds of practices or uh, things that you have either found are important or helpful or work that actually build resilience in, in the way you're describing? Well, I think that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's mainly three things. It's uh, uh, that people are uh, in a situation where they can uh, form uh, safe relationships and empathic relationships to others. Uh, and the second thing is to, to give people as much control over their situation as possible, because they have lost almost all control. So when they can do things, they can change things in, uh, in life, then uh, there is a possibility to build up competence. And, and the last very important thing is that they uh, have the ability to, uh, to talk with other people, to try to understand what has happened, what is happening to them now, and uh, how, how they can think about the future. Because we, what we have found is that the future, is in, in a way, disappears because you don't have either the context to plan the future, but not the mental capacities because you are traumatized. It's also interesting to think that the future disappears because the past has also disappeared. Yes. That the, uh, and I am very um, taken by your focus on the moral injury. Mm -hmm. uh, of what happens in migration and the undermining of a capacity to believe in the goodness of others. Yes. Mm -hmm. is, is really important. Yes, it's, it's uh, not only the goodness of others, but in the goodness of oneself. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, I think the, the concept that was developed by, uh, by Nidlan, I think, on survivor guilt, is really important. I think I've found this problem in almost all of my patients who have been traumatized, but it's all very often hidden because it's a lot of shame. They, they, did, they were in a situation where close ones, where friends were uh, injured or killed and they couldn't do anything. And this is something that sits quite deeply Mm -hmm. uh, in, in very many. And some are, uh, the whole life is, uh, so to speak, uh, determined by this experience of not being able to help. And yeah. a very severe guilt feeling. Yeah. yeah. Well, that seems important to, to, to say and to, to notice. Um, could you... Um, how, how are you having experiences or in your consulting just of thinking with others uh, or on your own about what this particular moment of the pandemic and the political and social crises around it, have, have you noticed something different either in the people working with refugees and burnout, et cetera, or in the 
people who are arriving under these conditions. So I think we're all trying to take into account what's what is happening in this moment. Yes, I, well, uh, it's very obvious that the COVID-19 pandemic has a severe influence on refugee populations, uh, both during flight and also after they arrive somewhere. Uh, we know that uh, they have become more isolated. Uh, the help that they need is difficult to get. They, uh, the organization of refugee camps suffers. So uh, all from food to sanitary uh, conditions are deteriorating. Uh, they are living uh, in tents in, in the winter cold and uh, really freezing. And what is also been documented quite well now is that there's an increase of violence, especially against women refugees and girl refugees. That has been observed in several uh, refugee camps around uh, the world by UNHCR, uh, the, the U UN Refugee Organization. So it's a great concern uh, now that uh, they are, the, many are really in need of more humanitarian help in addition to, to medical help and so on. I think there was something in the American press about um, the concern that in particular young women were sometimes being brought into human trafficking and sex trafficking. And, um, but you're also talking about violence in the refugee camps as well yeah. as mm -hmm. the particular fate. And, uh, um, and what are what when your view what are what is being done to address any of this in in more you know what what would be some explicit ways that either it is or isn't being addressed? Mm. Well, I think uh, first the generally the conditions for refugees during flight and in different camps has deteriorated the last years. Now the concern is to try to keep uh, keep refugees uh, away from the West. And this means that they are put in camps around Europe, for example, North Africa and uh, the Middle East, where the conditions are quite bad. And in this, in this situation, uh, the, the human smugglers are uh, very much governing the situation and they cooperate with uh, this organization who are taking uh, women uh, and girls for trafficking and so on. Uh, uh, so this is uh, as an, a problem that has increased. So on a general level, of course, uh, the, the best thing would be then, uh, the prevention would be to make the generally the conditions better for refugees. But that's not the policy now. Mm -hmm. The policy is uh, pro producing, you can say, uh, human suffering on a very large scale, mm -hmm. including that many are uh, kid kidnapped, so to speak, into uh, trafficking and, and uh, similar things. Wow. Um so I guess um, this makes me wonder about the impact of all this on the healthcare workers, people mm -hmm. like yourself and the people that you're, you know, train and um, how how are people who are actually the, the either the psychological or physical healthcare workers, how mm -hmm. are people managing in this moment, which sounds so catastrophic. Uh, yes, and, and uh, that is um, uh, uh, actually a big problem because it's uh, because of the COVID, the support that uh, one usually could do by traveling to uh, uh, to where they work in the refugee camp and, and give supervision or support and so on is no longer possible. But it's the, lots lots of things is going on uh, online. Of support groups and so on, mm -hmm. but but the health workers uh, are very much affected by the general policy in many places. Mm -hmm. 
uh, where where the the conditions of the refugees are really appalling uh, many places and it's very hard to work there so any improvement in the conditions makes it much more much better for the health workers mm -hmm. because then they can uh, have more hope for their patients to say it very simple <laughs> It's interesting. I had this association when I was just listening to you talk about this, of this <clears throat> paper that Sam Gerson wrote, When the Third is Dead, about, and he's describing a British nurse uh, going into the opening of a concentration camp and seeing people in such misery. But you couldn't really speak to them. You just had to sit by their side and rock with them in a very just in attempting to join them in this somatic body way. Yeah, but, yeah. but it it sounds it sounds <laughs> horrifying both for the refugee but also for anybody trying to actually yeah, gay, yeah. Who would take care of them. Absolutely, yes, yes. And uh, and for for people like this city they are in the those who are in concentration camps and similar things. When they meet uh, kind of normal people it's kind of horrifying because they see yeah. in their gaze towards them that what a miserable situation they yeah. are in mm -hmm. and that's a that's a general problem of course which you, makes it very difficult for severely traumatized to to ask for help because the gaze that you get back is so yeah. filled with horror. And yes, yes, and you, and you realize what bad condition you are in. Uh, and, and this not only how you look, but how, how you look inside, so to speak. So I know you have been doing um, consultation and research work with people, with people in Eastern Europe. Are you and your colleagues trying to think about what is a political um, active activity that that actually, you know, you're, you're describing how hard it is to actually help the refugees mm. and that things are going awry at a level of policy. Um, is there sort of elements of activism and, and things that you think or your colleagues are talking about, about what to do and whether one can do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think we are uh, a bit uh, uh, what do you call it uh, uh, this not, not very encouraged to 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 see possibilities to, to do things on a political level. But I know that um, uh, we we are of course writing in newspapers. We are dialogue with authorities around the refugee situation. Vladimir Jovic, he he is very active. He has organized uh, service for uh, refugees and war veterans uh, uh, in in the Balkans. A very very important network of clinics who, who help them. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one way that uh, keeps up, uh, us up. And we have had uh, uh, centers for uh, traumatized refugees here in Norway and so on. So we, had, we have done a lot, but uh, we see that the, the forces who are producing the, uh, the misery for these people are really uh, strong uh, and and uh, now it's even stronger I think uh, than it has been before but we're trying trying to do so N now probably we will have um, a group of Yazidi refugees coming to Norway mm -hmm. and uh, we have done research on Yazidis in Kurdistan Iraqish Kurdistan mm -hmm. interview these uh, that's women and and uh, children who have been in uh, been imprisoned by the IS mm -hmm. uh, ISIS mm -hmm. have been in slavery sexual slavery uh, you name it it's it's really terrible mm -hmm. and, and then we try to uh, uh, to to um, 
inform uh, the healthcare system about the special condition for this group, about the religion and the tradition, what they have been through, what is the best way to, to help them, and, and so on. And these, these are, uh, they, they are very much affected on a bodily level, these, these women. What I was thinking about was that when you, you are also the providing assistance and advice to the people doing the clinical work mm. with such persons, and it's both somatic and it's so deeply unconscious and psychological, and it seems like it's such an important mm. intervention. Um, but it's actually making me worry about something that I try to write about, which is the difficulty that, that analysts and healthcare workers have in taking care of themselves. Yeah. And so you're describing a situation that's so arduous and so morally unsettling uh, to encounter that I, I'm, I'm, I think that's, I'm thinking about the cost to the healthcare worker, to the analyst, to the clinician um, in this regard. Yes, yes. Uh, and of course, we can see the many who are uh, working in this context, they are kind of driven. They, they don't give themselves rest. Uh, you have to say to people, you have no, you have to go on vacation. You, you should stop now because uh, people are very concerned and you, you feel guilt, of course, when you are in a good condition uh, relatively yourself and then you see people are suffering so much. Uh, and this is a special count to transference, you can say, that yeah. you have to work in when you're helping people. It's such an important point, and yet it's so hard for us as a profession to be self-caring as well as yeah yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, much. Hmm. wow this is a lot to absorb uh just but really i think for you for you to be telling us this and giving us a kind of vision into what is happening to refugees to healthcare workers to uh, to, uh, to our culture and to our world i i just am very grateful to you and it's it's a lot of very painful um, mm -hmm. things to uh, uh, absorb. And I, I think it's sort of um, how do we maintain our moral compass with so much uh, terrible disarray? Is it, you know, how do we help others, but how do we also stay healthy? You know? Yes, I think that's really important. Yeah. Self-care self and to really have a kind of backing for me, this family. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and music. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you so much uh, for this uh, interview. This was really helpful, and I think it will really open a lot of information to our community. And um, I'm just very grateful for you mm -hmm. taking the time. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You.